argue with Pluto here by Clyde Tomba. Uh, and that's why most people come to visit us these days. We get 100,000 visitors a year. We're hoping to get more. I'll talk about that in a second. So Pluto is sort of Lowell's claim to fame, but there are other claims to fame too that you might be less familiar with. Oops, let's see. Oh, this is a telescope you can visit where Pluto was discovered that it was used to make the observations of, of uh, Pluto. Uh, so that's open to the public. Vesto Slipher was an astronomer here at Lowell and he made the first observations that showed that the universe is expanding, that galaxies are moving away from us. And he didn't realize what he'd seen. He didn't interpret it as the expansion of the universe. And when Hubble came along and used Slipher's data along with some of his own data that Hubble had collected to conclude that all the galaxies are moving away and there's this expansion, that sort of thing. But it was really Slipher who did the first observations that showed almost all the galaxies are moving away from us. And that was the beginning of the whole concept of the Big Bang. Vera Rubin did a lot of her pioneering work on dark matter here at Lowell Observatory in the 1970s. She, as you know, she studied the the rotation speeds of uh, spiral galaxies, how fast the stars are moving, and concluded that there must be lots of invisible matter there because we could see its gravitational pull on the stars. And But a lot of those observations she did were done right here at Lowell. Today, we have uh, about 15 research astronomers. We also have some postdocs and some graduate students. And we have access to a 4.3 meter telescope, the Lowell Discovery Telescope, it's located in Happy Jack. It's about an hour outside of Flagstaff. And it's our workhorse instrument. Uh, it's open 300 nights a year. Lowell astronomers get about half that time. We get about 150 nights a year. So with like 15 astronomers, that means we get sort of on average 10 nights each uh, on a four meter class telescope, which is pretty nice. You can't get that in, in many places. We have partners though to help pay the bills. So we sell about half the time on the telescope to partner institutions. So these are currently Boston University, University of Maryland, Yale University, Northern Arizona University right here in Flagstaff and University of Toledo. So they all get different amounts of time depending on how much they can wish to purchase, uh, but they get roughly half the time together uh, on the telescope as well. We have other telescopes uh, a little bit closer to Flagstaff. These are about a half hour outside of town on Anderson Mesa. Uh, the big telescope here, we, oops, sorry, the big telescope here we actually recently sold to Boston University, but we have uh, other telescopes, uh, 42 inch, 31 inch, and we're placing a, a new one meter telescope out there uh, in the near future as well. Here on Mars Hill, which is where the headquarters of the Lowell Observatory is located, if you've been here in the past, a lot has changed probably since you were last here. We now have what we call the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory or the GODO. And it's just a world-class uh, facility for public stargazing. So you can see these are beautiful glowstones we have to sort of illuminate the path up to the telescope. And it's got six different telescopes ranging from a beautiful five inch refractor with some of the nicest optics I've ever seen to a 32 inch Dobsonian there's a 14 inch and a 17 inch uh, plane waves. There's a 16 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. It's really good. And on a, on a good night, we can get 500 or more people up there during the summertime. So if you get a chance to come up again, you know, Flagstaff was the first official dark sky city. So the skies are pretty nice up here in general. Uh, so it, it's a great opportunity to come look through the telescopes. We're growing. We, as I said, we get about 100,000 visitors a year but we're bursting at the seams. And we could easily accommodate more people if we only had more space and more facilities for them. So we're building that. We're building a new visitor center called the Lowell Astronomy Discovery Center. And it's a $50 million project that will open in 2024. And it's going to be, we hope really sort of a state of the art and something that will really draw people to Flagstaff. You know, a million people a year go to the Grand Canyon we want to siphon more of them off to come visit us up here on Mars Hill. And so as you walk in, there'll be uh, a, a visitor gallery with uh, art and science and things to sort of welcome the visitors. And if I had to summarize the whole scope of our 
visitor center and the exhibits that we're going to have, it's telling the history, telling the story of your atoms. Your atoms have been in some amazing places over the last 14 billion years. And we're gonna tell you that story essentially. That's kind of the underlying theme to all of this. So we've got, we're planning three astronomy exhibit halls eventually, one about the solar system, one dedicated to stars, and one dedicated to galaxies and cosmology and the universe, et cetera. There'll be interactive exhibits. We're having some that are for visually impaired people. They'll be tactile. We've got sonified exhibits so you can hear astronomical images and things like that. It'll be pretty cool, pretty, pretty state of the art. We also have a large theater. We're not gonna have a traditional planetarium, but we've got a large sort of 180 degree uh, theater to show uh, both uh, prepared presentations and also we're gonna have live presentations. One of the great things about Lowell is our educators who interact with the public, people just rave about them. And so we wanna give opportunities for people to ask any question they've ever had to uh, uh, in the universe theater, for example. Also, because we are a dark sky city, you know, I can see the Milky Way when I walk my dog at night from my house right here in Flagstaff. Uh, we have a planetarium, an open sky planetarium, which is up on the roof of the building. So it'll be possible for people to sit outside. And I should mention, because it's Flagstaff, we're at 7,000 feet. Last time I knew the seats are going to be heated so your bums don't freeze when you're sitting out there. And so our educators will be able to point out things in the sky for people to see. We'll even have a large screen. You know, you can point to the Orion Nebula or, or the constellation Orion, and then we'll have a, a really cool screen that will actually display, say, an HST image of the Orion Nebula without ruining your night vision, for example. So it'll be pretty, pretty unique kind of facility. Um, there's something we call the diverse universe wall. What we're doing is featuring plaques, you can see here, oops, sorry, plaques with short biographies of 70 different people who have been involved in astronomy in one way or the other, whether they're astronomers, whether they're uh, space artists, whether they're science journalists, many different ways. And the whole goal is for anybody to walk in, especially children, and to see somebody on the wall and say, that's me, I could do science, I could do astronomy too someday. So more than half the people that we feature are women. There's people from, I forget, 40 countries or something. It's, it's a really diverse group, hence the name. Uh, and it's hopefully will just inspire that next generation, kids who maybe never thought they could be an astronomer to realize, oh, I could do that as well. So we're pretty excited about that. Anyway, so uh, you know, I hope that encourages you to come visit us at Lowell. The new visitor center will open in probably fall of 2024. And I think it'll be a really unique experience. So I hope we'll see you up here on Mars Hill sometime. So let me get to the topic at hand. Uh, this is uh, an overview, as I said, of what the universe looks like on the larger scale. And one of the things I'd like you to take away is just this idea that astronomers are really cartographers, we're really map makers. We're mapping the universe every day, every year, uh, and it's getting better with time. But if you think about map makers of years gone by, it was quite a challenge. It was a slow process. And the big problem was just lack of data, right? You know, as ships sailed the world, they would bring back information about land masses they encountered and coastlines and things like that. And this allowed map makers to try and create a, a map to represent what the world looks like. So this is a map from 1570, based on information, again, from ships that were sailing the world, et cetera. And as you can see, it's okay, but it's not great. You can recognize Africa pretty easily. You can see Europe and Asia. North America sort of resembles North America. Poor South America looks like a potato here. Uh, but that was the best you could do in 1570 with the data that were available. But it didn't take much longer, about a century later, as more ships sailed the seas, brought back more information, the maps were getting better over time. So here's a map from 1674. Suddenly South America kind of resembles South America. Africa's looking pretty good. Europe and Asia are looking pretty good. Australia's here. There's even New Zealand, I guess. North America is missing a little bit, but generally it's not doing bad. And then by 1794, oh, it starts to look like a modern map. 
of the world, right? So more observations, more data, better map of the world. And it's the same thing with astronomy. We want to map not just what our planet looks like, but what the universe looks like, what the distribution of stars is like, what the distribution of galaxies is like. And so it's a slow process and we're still in many ways in the early days with our sort of crude maps of what the universe looks like, but it's something that's driven people for as long as there's been society really, this is the earliest depiction of the heavens. This is called the Nebra sky disc. It's the oldest known depiction of the night sky. And it was created about 4,000 years ago by bronze age people. And if you look, you can see uh, the um, clump of stars here represents the Pleiades. You can see the sun and the moon, of course. And this was a depiction of what the sky looked like to people 4,000 years ago. Many societies tried to do this. Here's a map from China from around 650 AD showing constellations, right? So how the stars were distributed into the sky and grouped according to this particular culture uh, uh, centuries ago. Here's a Pawnee star chart made on leather uh, in the 1700s. And they depicted the stars that they saw in the sky and there's some recognizable constellations, the Big Dipper, Little Dipper, the Hyades, uh, the North Star, all that sort of stuff. This was their map of what the heavens looked like. The first sort of scientific approach to mapping the universe on the biggest scales was by William Herschel, the famous astronomer, who in 1785, what Herschel basically did was he counted stars in different directions in space. And his goal was to figure out what's, how big is the universe, uh, what's its shape, and where are we located in, in the universe. So he did this by counting stars in different directions. The idea being if you see more stars in one direction, the universe probably extends further in that direction compared to another one, for example. And so he made these painstaking observations of counting stars in different directions. And what he concluded was that we live in a flattened system of stars, which is true. And lucky us, we happen to be near the center of it, right? So we're near the center of creation, essentially. So that was Herschel's scientific depiction of what the universe looks like. He didn't know that there were, the Milky Way was one of many galaxies and that sort of thing. But of course, Herschel's map was wrong for, for a number of reasons, but mostly because he didn't know about interstellar dust. All this stuff that blocks our views of distant stars, with, which James Webb is penetrating right now to give us these amazing views. Uh, but he didn't know about this dust that blocks our view of the most distant stars. So he wasn't seeing very far into space. He wasn't even close to sampling even the extent of the Milky Way galaxy, right? But it was a good effort. It was the best effort you could do at the time. That's how science progresses. Many, um, many decades later, we have a clear view of what we think our Milky Way galaxy looks like. And this is an image of another galaxy, which if you could get a bird's eye view and go far off in space, our Milky Way would probably look pretty similar to this galaxy. It's, it's got a beautiful spiral structure. It's got a bar-like structure in the middle, which you think the Milky Way does too. And the sun would be about two thirds of the way out, right? We live kind of in the, in the suburbs of, of our galaxy. Oh yeah, there you are, you are here. So um, here's another Hubble image of another spiral galaxy. It also probably looks a lot like the Milky Way would look like if you were you know, an astronomer in this galaxy looking back at, at the Milky Way. Uh, again, beautiful spiral structure and, and that sort of thing. So we've got a pretty good understanding, we think, of what the Milky Way looks like, but we can always improve on it. So the Gaia spacecraft was launched in 2013, and its mission has been extended now to 2025. And its mapping is producing a three-dimensional map of the stars in the Milky Way. So far, it's cataloged a billion objects, uh, and it's got 3D information for many of them. But even a, a, a billion objects is less than 1% of all the stars in the Milky Way, right? So we're still only sampling a small piece of our own galaxy. But 
it's just an exquisite view of what the Milky Way looks like. So this is the most recent Gaia image. So we're looking from the sun essentially, right, towards the center of the Milky Way here. Again, you see all these wispy dust, you know, the ashes of dead stars and where new stars will eventually be born. Uh, and you see down here, the large and small Magellanic clouds, these two small galaxies that orbit the Milky Way. Uh, so it's just, uh, you know, an ever sharper view of what our galaxy looks like. And Gaia is, keeps releasing data sort of every year, uh, improving the map even further. For a long time though, astronomers knew that there were these other weird objects in the sky that they called nebulae. And these nebulae, nobody knew what they were. Here's a drawing from 1847 of what one of these things looked like through a telescope. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, people debated were these other solar systems forming from clouds of gas. Other people speculated were these other, you know, they poetically called distant island universes, other star systems far, far away, far beyond our own region of the universe. Here's another picture of a nebula from 1849. You can start to recognize a spiral pattern in there, for example, right? Um, so nobody was quite sure what these things were or what to make of them. So along came Edwin Hubble, uh, uh, some of his many pioneering uh, efforts was he was the first to show convincingly that these nebulae were in fact other galaxies located far beyond our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And he did this by careful observation of the Andromeda Nebula, the Andromeda Galaxy, and identifying variable stars. And by comparing these variable stars of known period, they changed their brightness with similar stars in the Milky Way, he could infer from their apparent brightness how far away the Andromeda galaxy must be. And it was way far farther away than anybody had imagined. So today we know Andromeda is about 2 million light years away. Uh, and that's still uh, our, our nearest neighbor, right? So when you look at Andromeda through your telescopes, you know, you're looking at light that's traveling for 2 million years to reach you. And that, that's our closest closest big neighbor, basically. We're on a collision course with Andromeda, so we're getting closer by the day. Uh, I'll show you a simulation in a second, but basically we're due to collide with Andromeda in about 4 billion years. So life's going to get interesting because the sun will be swelling up and evaporating the oceans on the earth and everything. Meanwhile, if, if whoever's surviving at a time will get a spectacular view as the Andromeda galaxy gets closer and closer. So this is a computer simulation showing this collision with us and Andromeda. At the bottom here, you see time in the future in billions of years. So that's almost a billion years in the future. This is the Milky Way. And you watch, you'll see the Andromeda galaxy in a second. There it is, along with uh, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. So gravity is just relentlessly bringing us and the Andromeda galaxy ever closer together. And eventually we're going to collide. So we're up to 3 billion years into the future now. Now watch as the two galaxies get close, they pass right through each other, but a spray of stars goes off into space, carrying away the energy of the collision and slowing them down. And so then they come back together and they merge into one new galaxy that astronomers have cleverly named Melchometa. Um, and the sun with all of its planets in tow will just be part of this new bigger galaxy. Uh, so, uh, one of the questions people often ask is, are, are stars going to collide when this happens? Uh, is the sun going to get hit by another star or the planets torn out of the Milky Way? And the odds of that happening are, are really zero. And it's simply because the distance between the stars is so enormous that even when our galaxy collides with the Andromeda galaxy, the odds of any stars ever hitting is, is basically zero. So the sun will just become part of this new bigger galaxy system at some point in the future, say five billion years from now. Now we know today that there are many, many other galaxies. This image here is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and we're zooming into it now. So you're seeing the nearest galaxies first and we're looking at ever more distant galaxies. And the Hubble Ultra Deep Field uh, was taken by essentially pointing the Hubble Space Telescope at one region of the sky and keeping the shutter open for the equivalent of 11 days, right? It did 400 orbits around the earth. 
snapping an image of the same boring part of the sky. There was nothing particularly interesting about this region. In fact, you can see the region down here. It's this little uh, square relative to the size of the full moon. So it's a little patch of sky, right? But within this field, there are 10,000 galaxies and if you, at all distances. And so if you assume that's a typical region of the sky and you extrapolate over the whole sky, the conclusion is there must be hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe, in the observable universe. And in fact, there's probably much more than that because we can't see the faintest galaxies at these great distances, for example. So there could be trillions of galaxies out there. Uh, so that's what the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is, has shown. So my interest is using galaxies to map the universe. So a good analogy is if you think about Earth, you know, you're, you're an alien, you, you just arrived to Earth, and you want to know how, what the land masses are shaped like, how the land is distributed. Well, people are a convenient tool to use because we use lights. And so wherever you see the lights distributed, there's people there. And people live on the land because we don't do very well living in the middle of the ocean. And so the lights from human beings allow you to map the distribution of land on our planet. And the same thing is true with galaxies. The distribution of light from galaxies lets us map the distribution of matter throughout the universe. These are our, our beacons or our markers for telling us where the matter is in the universe. So that's one of my uh, research interests. There's a lot of work that's been done today. This is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey I'm sure you're all familiar with. And this is providing 3D positions of many, many galaxies. And this is a fly through of part of the slow digital sky survey, uh, computer representation, obviously, but showing you um, how the galaxy is distributed. You see, it doesn't really look random. I'll talk more about this, but there's some pattern or some clustering. Uh, galaxies are not just randomly scattered throughout space, basically. You can certainly see that in Sloan. One of the things we know quite clearly is that galaxies are very gregarious. Wherever you find one galaxy, you often find other galaxies. They, they like each other's company because of gravity, of course. This is a, one of the uh, most recent uh, uh, James Webb Space Telescope images of the Stephens Quintet. So it's uh, five galaxies, right? One, two, three, four, five. Although this one turns out to be closer than the other ones. It's not part of the system. But galaxies tend to clump together. They like each other's company for one reason or another. Here's another example called Seyfert's Sextet, which also one of these galaxies is actually uh, an interloper. It's not really at the same distance. But again, you see these galaxies are really very tightly packed together because of uh, gravity. We live in a small, what I would call a village of galaxies, cleverly called the local group. And it consists of about three dozen galaxies. There's the Milky Way down here, there's Andromeda, which is about 50% bigger than the Milky Way. Here's Triangulum. And both the Milky Way and Andromeda are surrounded by lots of little dwarf galaxies that swarm around them, sort of like bees around a hive. It's like the Magellanic Clouds, for example, but lots of other dwarf galaxies. And there's new ones still being discovered because they're small and faint, they're hard to see. Uh, so we live in a, it's a village of about 30, about three dozen uh, galaxies, a couple big ones, mostly small ones. But there are bigger systems of galaxies as well. These are what I would call cities of galaxies. So there's things like the Virgo cluster, for example, which you've probably seen some of the Virgo galaxies through your, your telescopes, uh, M87, all that sort of thing. Uh, so Virgo is Virgo is a city sort of like, it's like the equivalent of like San Diego of the cosmos, right? It's a city. It's about 50 million light years away from Earth, but there are even bigger cities on Earth and there are even bigger cities of galaxies in the universe. So this is the Coma Cluster located about 300 million light years away. And it has thousands of galaxies all moving around each other, dancing around each other because of the gravitational attraction that they have. So these are two giant galaxies in the center, but most everything you see here, except for the stars is uh, or many of the objects you see here are galaxies in the coma cluster itself. So this is sort of the equivalent of like a, a New York or a Tokyo 
of the cosmos, right? A really big cosmopolitan or metropolis. This is a, a really nice galaxy cluster called Abel 1185. Uh, it's located about 420 million light years away. And my colleagues and I were, were very happy. We got awarded a lot of Hubble Space Telescope time back in June to study this galaxy, uh, galaxy cluster, mostly next year. So you see a bunch of big galaxies, some smaller galaxies. This is called ARP 105, which is just a beautiful collision between two galaxies. And I'll talk more about those collisions later. Uh, so we're gonna study this city of galaxies in great detail. This shows the mapping of our uh, Hubble pointing. This is where Hubble telescope will be pointed starting in November to uh, map a big chunk of this galaxy cluster for us. So we're looking forward to that and hopefully we'll find some uh, exciting new results. There are even bigger galaxy clusters that we can also see them at quite enormous distances. This is one called Abel 1689. It's located 2 billion light years away from Earth. And virtually everything you see in here, everything with this golden color is a galaxy in Abel 1689. The galaxies are all crammed together in the center. In fact, they're so close together, they're touching. It's hard to know where one galaxy begins and the next one ends. So we're seeing this as it looked 2 billion years ago because it's 2 billion light years away, right? So we're seeing into the past, as you know, it's one of the marvels of astronomy. Here's another one, about 370, it's located 4 billion light years away. So we see it as it looked 4 billion years ago. So this is, um, you're probably familiar with these are gravitational lensing, right? So, you know, a, system, a massive system of galaxies like this has so much gravity, it could warp the light from more distant objects when it passes near them. And you get this sort of funhouse mirror effect that's gravitational lensing of more distant galaxies behind this cluster. You see another one here, for example. Uh, so that's 4 billion light years away. So, you know, imagine you were an archeologist. If you could go back to ancient Rome and see the people in their daily lives, talking on the street, farming, you know, going about their lives, what insights you'd be able to gain from that. And the beauty of astronomy is we can do that. We can look back in time and see when these cities of galaxies were forming or what they looked like 4 billion years ago compared to today, for example. Uh, so just to give you some perspective, oops. Ah, sorry again. So this is our local group again. Here's the Milky Way. Here's the Andromeda galaxy and the, all the small galaxies that kind of surround us. And there's not much in between in general, but those giant galaxy clusters like this one, they're so dense. There's so many galaxies crammed together that in the space between the Milky Way and Andromeda, you would literally have thousands of galaxies in that region. Uh, in those two million light years between us and Andromeda. So they're, as I said, they're the New Yorks and the Tokyos and the uh, Sao Paulo's of the, of the uh, Mexico City of the universe, right? So by looking further back in time, by looking at more distant galaxy clusters, we can try and find, just like trying to find the first human settlements. When did the first humans start to live together and form towns and villages and, and bigger systems? We can do this, we can look further back in time. So here's a galaxy cluster that is 5 billion light years away. So we're seeing it as it looked 5 billion years ago, right? It's a, roughly a third of the age of the universe. This is one of the first JWST images that was released. Beautiful, beautiful image of a, a galaxy cluster also 5 billion light years away. So here's the biggest galaxy in the cluster. Almost all these, faint fuzzy things are galaxies in the cluster. That's an annoying star. There's always an annoying bright star near anything you want to observe, extra galactic. And you can see loads and loads of gravitational lensing again, right? Because this is a massive galaxy cluster, 5 billion light years away. So one of the research projects I'm involved with is trying to find the very first settlements of galaxies, the very first cities of galaxies to form by looking even further back into the past. <clears throat> so this, for example, is a galaxy cluster that we see 10 billion years ago. And it's, it's not this whole image, it's this uh, biggish red galaxy and these fainter things around it. Because it's so far away, you can only see the very brightest galaxies. 
right? But we can see 10 billion years into the past and presumably even further. In fact, I saw a paper this week claimed to find uh, a, a galaxy cluster, a group of galaxies at a redshift of 3.7. That just means it was like really soon, really early in the universe, much, much earlier than this even. Um, so uh, it, it's pretty amazing what you can do these days. And there's a lot of work being done studying these cities, these clusters of galaxies. Here's a paper that came out in uh, earlier this year. Uh, a couple of researchers in China identified a sample of 151,000 of these galaxy clusters. This shows their distribution on the sky. So this is right ascension and declination. Um, and uh, it's got this kind of weird shape because it's not an all sky survey. They combine data from several different surveys to estimate distances of the galaxies, that sort of thing. But if you zoom in, like if I zoom in on a little region up here, it looks like this. So these, each of these clumps is a galaxy cluster. And they've got anywhere from you know, 10 to 50 galaxies sometimes. Um, and again, those are only the very brightest galaxies in the cluster, but we see hundreds of thousands of these things. And undoubtedly there's more, you just need deeper, better, wider observations to discover more of them. So it's pretty incredible. But one of the questions is when did the first galaxy clusters form? How soon after the Big Bang? Now, one of the consequences of galaxies liking to uh, hang out with each other is, you know, if you've been in a, a busy city, if you've been in New York or whatever, and you try and walk down a busy street, it's hard not to bump into somebody once in a while, right? It's just crowded. And the same thing is true with galaxies. If you're in one of these galaxy clusters, one of these cities, uh, you're going to bump into other galaxies pretty regularly. And so we see this in loads and loads of images. So this is a beautiful example of uh, a galaxy that sort of stretched or torn another galaxy through its gravitational pull, right? And so these sorts of collisions are really common. This is one of my favorite images. This is a uh, one, two, three, I think four galaxies, all just tearing strips off of each other, right? So these are all, all this faint fuzzy stuff is stars that have been pulled off of each galaxy by the gravitational tug of its neighbors. So it, there's a lot of this stuff that goes on uh, everywhere. This is a, another beautiful image. So this is a, a spiral galaxy, probably like our, not so different from our Milky Way seen edged on. And this is the shredded remains of a galaxy that got too close and got torn to pieces as it got closer and closer to the galaxy. So it's like, um, you know, like when, an, when a, an asteroid plummets to Earth and it breaks up, well, the pieces of the asteroid keep, or the meteorite, keep going in the same original direction, right? And so the same thing here, these are stars that once the galaxy got shredded, for a while they continue in their original orbits and eventually they'll disperse, but we still see this kind of ghostly glow of what was a, uh, once a former galaxy that just got torn to pieces by the gravitational pull of its neighbor. It gets worse. It's not just galaxies tearing strips off each other, it's actually galaxies cannibalizing each other. Uh, it's, a, it's a galaxy galaxy kind of universe out there and galaxies will eat each other. We see this quite often. So this is an image my colleagues and I took some years ago using the Gemini telescope, Gemini South telescope in Chile. Uh, and this is actually one of the biggest galaxies in the local universe, we think. It's a beast. You could fit dozens of Milky Way galaxies inside of this. It's huge. And in the center, you see one, two, three, four, that's actually a star, four or five uh, partially digested remains of this cannibal's victims. It hasn't finished chowing down yet, essentially. And eventually, these things will be disrupted too, and all their stars just become part of this bigger, ever more bloated galaxy with more gravity, you can pull in more neighbors and that sort of stuff. But galaxy cannibalism is quite common. And we think that's how big galaxies grow by eating their neighbors. And we know the Milky Way too is a cannibal, by the way. So this is a computer simulation showing the birth of one of those large galaxies. And just watch how frenetic it is. Watch how galaxies get pulled in, stripped to pieces, merging. Um, it's just a mess. Uh, and this is how we think most big galaxies are born. By, by eating their smaller neighbors.
So uh, this is taking place over billions of years, of course. Um, but anyway, it's, it's pretty messy. We know that our Milky Way, I should mention, is, is a cannibal as well. Um, we see evidence that it's cannibalized dozens of galaxies in the past. We still see some of those shredded remains of the other galaxies, for example. Um, so what I want to talk now is how we can use and, and look at the distribution of galaxies on even larger scales. You know, just as uh, humans collect into towns and cities, but then cities collect into states, and then you've got bigger systems like countries and so on. The same is true with galaxies. Sure, they gather together into groups and they gather together into villages and cities, these clusters of galaxies. But we also find evidence that they gather on even larger scales. And these are, as I said earlier, these are the early days of us trying to map what the distribution of galaxies looks like on the biggest scales in the universe. And I call this cosmic cartography. So this, for example, is a map. Uh, these maps were first, and people have been mapping the skies forever, as I explained earlier, but trying to get three-dimensional positions for galaxies, to know their position on the sky, but also their distance. That work really began in the 1980s. Uh, a couple groups did some really pioneering work, a really Herculean effort. There was so much effort to do this. Um, you know, tonight, these days, you can go to the telescope and you can get distances, redshifts, for thousands of galaxies in the night. And back in the 80s, it, it was one by one. It was a painful, painful process. It took a lot of effort. Um, so they're able to produce maps like this. So what this shows is this is right ascension along here. It's a narrow strip in declination. And then along this axis, or I should say along here or along here, this is effectively the distance from us measured in recessional velocity, the radial velocity of the Hubble expansion. And so you see the galaxies are not distributed at random at all. You see these long connected structures spanning millions of light years. And here's a really nice example. This is enormous structures, these kind of um, filaments of or these tendrils of uh, galaxy systems, right? On a much larger scale. So typical galaxy clusters, this is actually the Coma cluster in here, for example. Um, so these are really big structures and galaxies on these scales are not distributed at random. And so we've come to call this the cosmic web. This is another image of the sky taken with an infrared survey. And you can see that if you look at the distribution of galaxies, it's not random. You see they clump together, but also you see these beautiful filamentary, you know, sort of gossamer type structures. And so we call that today the cosmic web, like the webs of a, a spider web that all link up and join together. The distribution of galaxies also seems to have this kind of network or this, this web or the distribution to it. Here's a really nice, relatively nearby example. This is the per oops, sorry. This is the Perseus Pisces supercluster. And this is a map of all the galaxies uh, within a few hundred uh, light years of each other. Uh, and you see this long strands of galaxies, right? These coherent kind of structures. You see some galaxy clusters. These are the big cities of galaxies. Where you've got thousands of galaxies all together. You see between them, there are these long filamentary features. The Perseus Pisces supercluster extends over 50 degrees on the sky. It's, it's, it's relatively nearby, but it's still a, a pretty uh, impressive distance. It turns out we live in one of these things that we call superclusters, and it's called the Virgo supercluster. So in the middle here, you see the local group, the Milky Way and everything. And then you see over here, the Virgo cluster, which is much bigger than the local group, several thousand galaxies. And we're sort of on the outskirts of that, but it's all actually one giant system of galaxies that seems to be connected on these really large scales. There are other examples of these superclusters, even bigger ones that have been found. This one's called the Saraswati supercluster, which was discovered a couple of years ago by astronomers in India. And you can see a zoom in of it here. Right, so each of these dots, is actually a galaxy cluster, not just a galaxy, it's a galaxy cluster. And so the Saraswati cluster is believed to be home to over 100,000 galaxies. Saraswati, by the way, is the name of the Hindu goddess of knowledge. 
And so it's just enormous. You can see it extends 650 million light years from end to end. So it's an enormous structure of galaxies. In fact, one of the questions I'll, I'll touch on this in a, in a minute is, how do you form structures this big in the 14 billion year history of the universe? Is there enough time? How did you do it? Uh, can gravity do it? Can work this quickly uh, to form such immense structures? So this is located about 4 billion light years away from Earth, for example. There's even uh, bigger ones. This one's called Lania Kea. Lania Kea is um, the Hawaiian word for immense heaven. This is work that was done by Brent Tully and his group at the University of Hawaii. And again, you see these enormous collections of galaxies and galaxy clusters all seemingly linked together in this cosmic web, this network. The Lania Kea supercluster extends uh, about half a billion light years from end to end. And we may actually, we, the Milky Way in our local group, et cetera, may actually be just part of the outskirts of this enormous system. So we see the galaxies are clustered together on really, really large scales. There've been some recent evidence of uh, other large systems. This is something cleverly called the giant arc. Um, and it's a system of galaxies that was discovered in uh, January of this year. And it's about 3 billion light years across. And it would cover about 20 full moons from end to end, right? So it's an enormous structure of galaxies, all we believe at the same distance, all presumably a bona fide physical structure out there. And then there's an even bigger one, you know, wait, there's more. Um, this is, again, astronomers are not really good with names. So this is called the Huge Large Quasar Group. It's a, it's a pretty sad name. But um, uh, this was discovered um, using quasars. Um, Ken talked earlier about Martin Schmidt and his discovery of quasars. And so, you know, as you look really far out into space, it gets hard to see galaxies because they themselves start to get too faint to be seen easily. But quasars, which are powered by these supermassive black holes, emit a ton of light. And so that lets us see them really far away. And so there have been some groups that have been trying to look at the distribution of quasars at the very earliest epoch in the universe to see what kind of structures they trace uh, at, at the earliest uh, uh, stages in the universe's evolution. And so this is a structure of 73 quasars that stretches across 4 billion light years. These large groups of quasars are called large quasar groups. And then because this one's so enormous and they're running out of superlatives, it's called the huge large quasar group. Um, but it's just immense if, it's, if it exists, right? And that's the catch. Uh, I mentioned about, you know, these quasars are powered by supermassive black holes in the center. Um, and that's what allows us to see them. Um, but the question, is it real? And it all comes down to statistics. Is is this a bona fide physical system of quasars, or is it like the canals of Mars? You know, you can you can find even in a random distribution, you will find clumps of objects. And so, is this statistically significant? Is this a real collection of quasars, or is it just statistical noise, statistical fluke? There have been papers published back and forth about this, and I think it's definitely fair to say the um, the jury's out on this. Uh, nobody knows for sure. Because it raises some really troubling questions. If this object exists, if it's a real object of this size, looking back this far in time, it starts to raise questions of how you could have formed something so early in the universe that's this enormous. And then the whole idea of what's called the, the um, cosmological principle which says that when you look at the universe on the biggest scales, sure, on small scales, galaxies cluster together and you get cities of galaxies, et cetera. But on the biggest scales, the universe should be homogeneous and it should be the same in every direction. And the existence, if true, of enormous systems like this long ago would call that into question. At what point does the universe become homogeneous and the same in every direction? What scale do you need to look at? and it doesn't violate the cosmological principle, but I won't go into that. One of my own areas of research that I'm working on a lot for years, and I'm working on a, trying to finish a project right now, 
is looking at the shapes and alignments of these cities of galaxies, these galaxy clusters within these filaments. Because it turns out, these are some of the well-known galaxy clusters within the Perseus Pisces supercluster. And if you look close, you can see that this galaxy cluster is elongated sort of in this direction, and this one's elongated sort of this way. Uh, and each one is sort of elongated. And so we can actually look at the orientations of neighboring galaxy clusters as a tracer of filamentary superclusters on the largest scales. If you took this Perseus Pisces supercluster and you moved it way, way far away, you wouldn't see most of the galaxies. They'd be too faint. But you'd see the brightest ones in the galaxy clusters, and you could measure their shapes and their orientations, and they would still trace the filamentary structure at large redshifts, uh, at large distances. And we think we understand why this is. Galaxy clusters form in filaments, and material flows within these filaments and piles up in these regions to become galaxy clusters. There's like a river of matter, a river of galaxies flowing and piling up in certain regions. Computer simulations show us this. So this is the formation of a galaxy cluster for material flowing along these large filamentary superclusters and piling up here and growing over time. So one of the projects I'm working on is trying to look at galaxy clusters at the earliest ages of the universe, going back 10 billion years or, or 5 billion years, and to say, OK, we can't see most of the galaxies, but can we see if neighboring galaxy clusters of those early epochs are aligned? And if so, that could be a tracer of the large scale filamentary pattern in the early universe. Even if we can't see the pattern directly, because most of the galaxies are too faint, we can see the alignments of the neighboring clusters and that would allow us to trace this filamentary pattern in the very earliest stages of the universe. So this filamentary structure on the very largest scale is not a surprise. Computer simulations, if you put socks in computer simulations, um, show pretty convincingly this is exactly what you would expect. If you take uh, a bunch of small lumps, irregularities in the distribution of matter, in the early universe soon after the Big Bang, you have an expanding universe and you let gravity do its thing for 14 billion years, this is what you get. You get filaments. And I can talk in more detail about why that is if anybody wants to know. But it's actually really remarkable that, you know, the um, starting from the, the thinnest strands, the little lumps, small collections of atoms and particles here and there in the early universe these little tiny irregularities in the primordial matter distribution got amplified by gravity to produce the largest scale structures we see in the universe today. It's pretty remarkable. So I'm gonna show you a computer simulation of how we think these large scale uh, filaments have grown over time. This is something called the illustrious computer simulation. It's sort of a state of the art. And what they did was they simulated an expanding universe with some small irregularities in the early universe and you let her rip for 14 billion years. So the region I'm gonna show you in a second in this animation is about 300 um, uh, million light years across. And so you're gonna see, it's gonna evolve over time when I start it, and it's gonna slowly rotate just to change your view of it. But you'll watch as galaxies clusters grow, as the cities of galaxies grow over time, but also how this uh, network, this connecting uh, cosmic web between them also grows over time. So let me start this. So it's just rotating just to give you different views. Um, but you see time is going on, material streaming into the galaxy clusters, the filaments, these large super clusters are growing over time and becoming more and more pronounced uh, as well. And so they feed into these large galaxy clusters that form. Right, so we think we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on from these sorts of computer simulations. Uh, so the large scale structure of the universe that we see is exactly the, what we would expect to see given our understanding of what we think conditions were like in the early universe 
and what we think the age of the universe is. So there's no great surprise here. So let me just conclude by reminding you that uh, if you think back to the early maps of the Earth, boy, we sure got it wrong in the early days, but we got better with time. So take everything I've said today with a grain of salt, because our maps of the universe are still at an early stage. And what we think the universe looks like might be rather different from our, our current maps. Uh, it may turn out to be, look rather different uh, from what we think today. So let me just go to my summary. Uh, I hope I convinced you that we can use galaxies to map what the universe looks like on the very largest scale. They're the luminous bits of matter that we use to trace the stuff we can't see. We find these enormous superclusters of galaxies that span millions or even billions of light years in size. They're just enormous. And the distribution of galaxies in these superclusters reveals this cosmic web of interconnected filaments, right? So the universe on the largest scale looks kind of frothy, kind of filamentary. And then finally, come business at Lowell Observatory, I hope I convinced you of that. Uh, if you wait till 2024, our new visitor center will be open, but even if you come now, it's pretty amazing with our open deck observatory and everything else. So uh, thanks again very much. I appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, listen and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Let, let me start with one. You know, when looking at the cosmic web uh, as shown, you wonder is the origin of this structure, this transport system, if you will, almost looks like a vascular system. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. But, but did it originate with small differences in distribution of dark matter and regular matter at the beginning? But is there some over-organizing physical principle like a vascular system or some kind of that, something that's else? An, that's an actual question, Ken. I, I took out some slides for time, but I can show you some of these. Um, the, to answer your, your question quickly, um, Oh, I got to share again, sorry. Uh, let me share. Um, so yes, we think there were lumps in the original distribution of dark matter. And depending on the type of dark matter, you will get different sizes and amounts of clumpiness in the early universe. So if the dark matter is um, axions, or if the dark matter is neutrinos, you'd get different kind of structure on the very largest scale today. And so that's um, why uh, it's fast to me, it's fascinating that we can use the large scale structure of the universe to tell us something about the properties of matter on the subatomic scales, basically, right? But mm -hmm. your, your question, I took out a few slides. Let me just show these really quick. Um, let's see, share screen. Okay, so um, the, the sort of filamentary pattern that you see. You see in other things uh, as well. So this, for example, oh, yeah. are nerve cells in a human brain, right? And you see this kind of filamentary connectedness uh, between uh, nerve cells. This is on the left is a simulation of the large scale structure of the universe. That's sort of a luster simulation I just showed you, where yeah. instead of being you know brain cells and neurons, this is a cluster of galaxies and large scale filamentary structures and everything. So to me, who knows if there's some underlying principle, but it's, it's amazing that nature likes to recycle certain patterns, right? Uh, and you see this in, in many different uh, cases in nature, of course. So here's a city of Liège, Belgium, <laughs> the International Space Station at night. And you know, boy, it sure kind of, maybe it's just me, but, I could sure be convinced that looks like a galaxy cluster and, and filaments and that kind of stuff all feeding into it, right? Um, and there's even, uh, there's a computer simulation again showing the large scale structure of the universe, that kind of thing. Um, and there's even something called slime mold. So slime mold are these, they're single celled organisms that clump together into colonies. And as they search for food, they send out these tendrils that grow looking for, for food. And this is uh, showing a uh, simulation of how these um, slime molds grow over time. You see this kind of network, these sort of little filaments reaching out over time, looking for food for the colony, for the, 
colony of microorganisms. And interestingly, there was a paper written uh, um, two years ago uh, showing that using a computer model for how slime mold grows over time, its tendrils grow to look for food, did a really good job of also describing how the large scale structure of the universe looks today, these sort of filamentary features and networks that we see. So they actually wrote a paper uh, on this, revealing the dark threads of the cosmic web by using models of slime mold and how it grows over time. So if there's some great connection, I, I don't know, right? But it, I find it really fascinating that similar patterns are found on such vastly different scales in the universe, right? You get into fractals and all that sort of thing. Um, but it, it's pretty remarkable, I think, that people do find, uh, you do find similar kinds of patterns. I think there might be a question in the chat. A lot of pictures look like pictures of my retinas with the optic nerve and blood vessels from my eye doctor. That's absolutely true, right? And that's what that was Percival Lowell's curse, you know, and all the people that were looking for, uh, you know, canals or on, on Mars or you know structures on Venus and that kind of thing. So um, uh, you, you're right, but it's right when you go to the op I, I've gotten pictures of my my retina taken too, and it's it's it is like a filamentary structure in there for sure, all kind of leading to one place. Um, yeah, and neural networks. The other questions we all see are big brown bags similarity in its neutral networks, these images of galactic networks, brains within brains, absolutely. I think it was Francis Galton, who was um, Charles Darwin's cousin, some, you know, century ago, somebody to the effect that um, maybe we're just one cell in this giant organism of the universe or something like that, right? So uh, yeah, I agree, it's, it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, in fact, and Bob commented on um, fractal patterns, yeah, and the Fibonacci sequence and all that sort of thing. So yeah, it, it's, there's a really good book if you haven't read it. It's called, um, it's, it's out of print, but you can get it used on Amazon and elsewhere. It's called um, The Unfinished Universe by Louise Young. And it's a really good book because it talks about, you know, the, the Fibonacci sequence, for example, appears in the structure of seashells, but it also appears in other structures in nature. And so it's all about the universe. And she's a scientist. She's, she's a PhD from MIT, I think, in physics. And it's all about um, how the structure of the universe from the small scales to the larger scales is still forming and that it follows certain patterns. It's, it's quite an intriguing read. Um, whether or not you believe it, it's a very intriguing read and she makes a lot of really interesting points. So it's called The Unfinished Universe by Louise Young. I've got another question, Michael. Sure. Um, you show the uh, filmentation progressing and growing through time. If you run the clock backwards in time to, uh, I guess, first the inflation event, and then beyond that to some quantum mechanical theories of how things really started. Does, mm -hmm. does, the, uh, does the structure, the filamentary structure kind of go away? Uh, and become totally random as you go back in time to those those, that, that's those a, early periods, or or is there? And do the, does it match up with any uh, quantum mechanical theories of uh, the beginning of the universe? That's a great question. Um, as as you go further back in time in the simulation, the filamentary pattern is less pronounced, and if you go all the way back to you know inflation or go back to the sort of the Planck time, the quantum mechanical time, um, you wouldn't see this. But what you would see are the little micro microscopic clumps in the distribution of the dark matter particles. So we think, for example, that these fluctuations, these irregularities in the early universe were created by quantum fluctuations, basically. And so depending on the type of dark matter, whether again, it was neutrinos or axions or higginos or whatever, um, you would get slightly different patterns of these irregularities or clumpiness of these irregularities. And then if you wait 14 billion years and like gravity do its thing, you get slightly different large scale structures by today. It's almost like a, you think about chaos, right? You, know, you can start the same system twice and just slight initial differences, you get a, a different result in the end. 
So as you went far enough back in time, you wouldn't see the filamentary pattern. It does take billions of years to really be sort of noticeable. It's not there in the initial conditions for the simulations, for example. Um, but it starts to develop pretty much as quick as it can, but it just takes billions of years to be pronounced enough to be really visible. But if you went back far enough towards the, the sort of quantum earlier conditions, you would really just see um, uh, just lumps and bumps in the distribution of matter. But well, is there some correlation or is it totally random or? So it's not random, that's a good question. So um, we think that the type of dark matter, what kind of particles it might be, would produce different types of lumps on different scales, which gravity could then amplify. For example, neutrinos, right? So neutrinos are a very light, if a, a very light mass um, particle and if they were the dark matter, you wouldn't, it'd be difficult to form galaxies, for example, because as very light particles, neutrinos move really fast in the early universe. And what that means is that uh, pretty quickly, small clumps of neutrinos could just disperse because they're all zipping around so fast, they just smooth themselves out on galaxy sized scales. They could form structure on larger scales where it would take too long for them to diffuse out. But on small scales, if the universe was made of, if the dark matter was made of neutrinos, it's hard to form galaxies, for example. And likewise, if the dark matter is made of, you know, any, any of these hypothetical dark matter particles like axions or photinos, gravitinos, whatever, each of them predicts a slightly different kind of, you know, you've got, this many lumps on this size, this many lumps on this size, this many lumps on bigger sizes. And they make slightly different predictions, which then will get amplified in slightly different ways by gravity over 14 billion years. So for example, my PhD dissertation was, um, I used to be a theorist. So it was running computer simulations of uh, what galaxy clusters would look like depending on the type of dark matter. So galaxy clusters form an universe dominated by dark by uh, neutrinos, for example, they would look rather different today from galaxy clusters formed from what we call cold dark matter, like axions and that kind of thing. So uh, so yeah, different types of dark matter would, it, it's not just random lumps in the early universe. They actually had a little bit of a initial pattern or at least initial scaling of their sizes in the early universe. I hope that wasn't and, too and does, long does the does the elevation or the evolution of the filament filaments uh, depends uh, almost 100% on the dark matter or does normal matter have a significant influence? No, the normal matter is inconsequential. I'm sorry to break into all of this. Um, the dark matter can start clumping earlier than the baryons that make up you and me. So it starts growing early and then the, the normal atoms fall into the gravitational halo that the dark matter created. So we're just along for the ride, basically. <laughs> and we light up so you know we can be seen, um, but it's the dark matter that really drives all of us. You know, it makes up the vast majority of matter in the universe. It's, it's driving the gravity of everything. Yeah. Dave Decker asked, uh, and I was thinking about the same thing too, because I'm not sure we have a universal coordinate system because we don't really know the center and the shape in any kind of, you know, three-dimensional terms. Uh, That's right. Do we need a better coordinate system than our Earth-based right ascension and declination to describe these structures? Um, I, I I don't think so. I mean, you know, you you can you can make a Cartesian uh, X Y Z box if you want you can turn these into that sort of thing and in fact i'm doing that for one of my projects these days um but you know it's like you can find it you can describe any structure on earth in a sense with uh latitude and longitude mm -hmm. and if you want a third dimension you know altitude or or depth or whatever so i, I think ra and deck are probably fine the bigger part is the distance you know astronomers talk about distances in terms of redshifts or radial velocities and that's a really weird unit, you know. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, I, I think I think if we were to change coordinate systems, 
I think a lot of astronomers would advocate for doing away with magnitudes before doing away with RA and dash. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question? Please. Hi, thank you, Dr. West. What a wonderful lecture. You're a great you. teacher. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm an amateur kind of person who's interested in astronomy, but it struck me that quasar picture that you showed, how old is that picture and where do you find uh, pictures like that? Um, and which night sky is, is, was that found? And which night sky was that found? Thank you. Um, which, let me see which quasar picture you mean, like this, or, uh, or let me see. So I don't remember like which constellation uh, these might have been, and I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, and you know, this image, I think uh, Google is my friend, right? So I can find any image on Google practically. Uh, and so I'm sure that this might have been published in the paper, or might have been published in a press release or something like that. So that, that's where I got it. Um, and uh, yeah, but you know, there's the hard part in astronomy these days, just keeping up with everything. Every day I sign, sign into my computer and the first thing I do is I read the list of papers that were published the night before. And I just don't have time in the day to read everything. So you try and keep up with it and you try and find, oh, that's a really interesting discovery. And then here's a new image that, you, that goes with it and that sort of thing. But it, it is a challenge sometimes for sure. Thank you. And then uh, you seemed uh, surprised that there were so many quasars uh, lumped together, that that was unusual. Oh. Yeah, the, the question is just how you can, um, was there enough time to build a structure that big? It's like, you know, think about on earth, if you wanna build a skyscraper, you know, well, it's going to take, you know, months or years. You got to get the stuff together. The truck got to transport everything, this and that. You can't do it in, in three days. And in a sense, the same thing's true with these enormous systems. How is 14 billion years enough time, it's enough time to build a skyscraper? Is it enough time to build a system of quasars this big? Because gravity's the, the weakest force in nature. So you need a lot of time to amplify these tiny irregularities in the early universe and the matter distribution in the early universe and was 14 billion years enough time to form something this big and so that's the questions i mean i give my personal view i think there's a lot of really interesting large-scale structure out there i think this particular team that works on these quasar this huge large quasar group um they their statistics are sometimes questionable they'll say for example well um in fact, there was a paper that criticized this. Another astronomer, he did simulations. We call these Monte Carlo simulations. You just mm -hmm. do a bunch of permutations. And so he said, if I put 73 quasars in a region of space the same size as this uh, at random, just at random, 8% of the time, you would find a structure this big or bigger, which means to an astronomer, that's not statistically significant because statistical significance we usually say it's got to be like less than a 1% chance. So 8% of the time you get something that looks like this, it isn't a real object, it's just a random clump of quasars. And you could argue the contrary. I mean, 92% of the time, you wouldn't get something like this. But from um, a scientific or statistical perspective, the argument was it's just not, you could get this from randomness. And in fact, we know quasars cluster on smaller scales, so it's not even a random distribution to begin with. I guess the argument was it's not it's not surprising to find an occasional big system like this. It doesn't mean it's a genuine physical system. That's a that's a very convoluted argument. I apologize, but thank you very much. Sure, thanks for your question. Do you think in this cosmic web, which seems to have a an organizing principle, or certainly a uh, transport of material. Do you think they're broken segments of it? Oh, absolutely. That's a great question. Uh, absolutely, right? Because, um, you know, stuff can't flow along filaments forever. At some point, the filaments will have to start, to, it's like tributaries to a river, right? They'll have to mm -hmm. dwindle and fade away at some point. Um, and, you know, you can run these simulations far into the future and, and see what it looks like. People tend not to do that because 
the simulations are really expensive to run. And so who cares what happens 20 billion years from now kind of thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, in principle, these things will, will break up over time and you'll form ever bigger galaxy clusters and the filamentary pattern will become less and less pronounced over time. I'm trying to read Bob Ross's question. Bob, oh, yeah. <laughs> do you, does the structure seem to be growing? Yes. I mean, galaxy clusters are growing. Uh, so, for example, as I said, galaxies cannibalize, big galaxies cannibalize smaller ones to grow. Galaxy clusters cannibalize smaller groups around them. Right? It's like, think about like um, here in Arizona, Phoenix. Phoenix has just grown over time. It swallows little neighboring, um, you know, Tempe and, and, and all these other places. And so galaxy clusters too, uh, these what we call subclusters, fall into them and, and get swallowed up as well. So galaxy clusters are growing over time. And the filamentary structure is probably still becoming more pronounced over time. Um, but eventually, again, it will start to uh, be less obvious let's put it that way but yeah i mean gravity gravity never quits gravity never sleeps and so um it just keeps bringing things together and as a big galaxy eats its neighbors and gets bigger it's got more gravity to pull in even more neighbors and so eventually you just be left with probably a few big bloated galaxies and galaxy clusters out there and not much remains of their victims uh, another way to course. ask another way to ask that is the uh, with the expansion of the universe are the voids growing in proportion to that expansion? Excellent question. And I forgot to point that out one of my earlier images. I don't know if I can find that really quick. Um, you know, like if you look here, you can see uh, these empty regions, right? And these are voids. And yes, the voids should grow over time as well, you know, their, their diameter or whatever, as the, uh, as the universe continues to expand. That's right. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, uh, thanks for asking. I should have pointed out earlier. You, you can see voids, regions where there are few or, or no galaxies uh, as well, right? So in, in this image too, you see these kind of under dense regions. And yeah, we call these things. Excuse voids. me, Dr. West, can you share your screen, sure. please? Oh, so my apologies. I thought it was my bad. Um, let me do that again. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Share screen. Sorry about that. Um, So, so I'll go back really quick. So this is one of the earliest maps of the distribution of galaxies in large scales. You can see this region down here where there aren't any galaxies. So that's one of those voids. Uh, and you can see one up here. You can see these under dense regions and these should grow over time as the universe continues to expand. And you can see them here as well. Uh, again, a region is very under dense in galaxies uh, or over here, that sort of thing. Uh, and in the Perseus Pisces supercluster as well, you see the dense ridge, dense filaments, then you see these under dense regions, these void regions as well. So those will grow over time as the universe uh, continues to expand. So it's the growth is correlated with the expansion of the universe. Yes. Yeah. I, it, you know, it's weird because on, on the largest dimension, these superclusters should just continue expanding with the expansion of the universe. But on smaller scales, of course, like on galaxy cluster scales, gravity is able to overcome uh, the expansion of the universe. So that's why the Milky Way is not expanding or you and I aren't expanding um, and the earth isn't expanding. Uh, so on smaller scales, gravity wins, but on larger scales, um, it should, the, the super cluster should continue ex getting stretched with the expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. You showed That's data from the Sloan uh, a, a Sky Survey. Uh, yeah. it, it sort of brings to mind what is what's the Sloan uh, system up at Apache Point doing today? You know, Palomar went from the original Sky Surveys. Now they're doing the Zwicky Transient Facility, looking you know high cadence astronomy, looking for things that change. What are these big Sky Surveys? accomplish or how do they evolve over time? That's a great question. I mean, there's, so Sloan is still going. They're, they're maybe focused more on some specific projects. So for example, the last few years, 
they actually devoted a lot of time to identifying quasars. They are doing something that is called the BOSS survey, the Baryon Acoustic Oscillations. This is the idea that um, as a result of inflation, there were little ripples that went through the matter distribution in the universe. You could see that today. And so they're using quasars to try and map that. So I think Sloan is looking at maybe a little bit more specific projects these days. There's a dark energy survey, of course. The dark energy survey is also mapping the universe on really, really large scales. Um, and its uh, goal ultimately is to figure out uh, about the dark matter. Uh, more to learn more, to pin down, sorry, the dark energy, to pin down the property of the dark energy that's causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. So that's kind of its primary goal, but there's a lot of other interesting science coming out of it as well. So I think, you know, and the beauty of a lot of these surveys, Sloan, I forget, it's like 10,000 peer reviewed papers have been published based on Sloan data or something. It's, it's amazing. And uh, some of the most interesting science that comes out of these surveys are the ones that you could never have anticipated, right? You've got the main goals from the bread and butter science. Then you got the, the weird object nobody ever saw before. Same thing with James Webb these days, right? All the news, I don't know if you saw the pictures today of Neptune and the rings of Neptune. Yeah, yeah. It's phenomenal, right? And so, um, uh, but, you know, James Webb is going to show us things we've never seen before. And it's not, it can't map the universe. It's too small a field of view. But uh, it's going to reveal some pretty amazing things. So I think a lot of these surveys, they do adapt and evolve over time. Um, and once they've sort of done their, their, their reason, their main project, their main reason for existence, there's plenty of other uh, science that can be done as well. And as long as there's propellant to keep things going or whatever, uh, they'll usually keep going as long as they can. I think Seppi has the question. Yeah, uh, Dr. West, I have one more question. So yeah. I'm a medical person. And so if we need information, there's a European database called MBASE, uh, based in the Netherlands. And then we have PubMed, which is um, our government um, source of information. Um, is there a government source of information where all astronomy information goes. Um, is there like a database like that where you can go and look look at stuff? That's a great question. Um, there's a few. So, for example, most of these results are published in scientific journals, right? And one of the problems at the moment is that most of them are behind paywalls. So, I mean, I've actually published papers. It's a really weird system. So. I publish a paper, I have to pay the page charges to publish the paper. Then if I don't have a subscription to that journal, I can't read my own paper. It's so bizarre. Um, but the Biden administration just announced two weeks ago that by 2025, any research that's funded by taxpayers, that's you and me, has to be open access for everybody. So that's great. So it means if you wanna read one of the papers I talked about tonight, you'll be able to go read it. It won't be behind a paywall that you have to subscribe to. So I think that will be, yeah, it's really important for, again, the taxpayers pay for all this research. Of course, they should have access to the results and the, and the papers and the outcome. Um, also in like developing countries where, you know, one of the journals we subscribe to here costs $10,000 a year or something. That's a lot of money, right? And so um, I think it will really help make science more egalitarian for everybody. Um, in terms of like, databases so for example there's no one central repository but for example the hubble space telescope has its own archive so you can go to the hubble space telescope archive right now say i'd like to see a picture of the orion nebula and you can download it you can get the data you paid for it i paid for it so it's yours same thing with james webb you'd be able to access the the images from james webb and there's some amateur astronomers spend a lot of time making these amazing images from the archived data in the web and the Hubble archives. There are things that are called virtual observatories where you can go to an object, let's say I wanna know about the Andromeda Nebula, but I wanna know what images were taken with Spitzer, an infrared space telescope, or I wanna know what X-ray observations were made of the Orion Nebula. And you can get those data. They're kind of a central, repository or they're more like a linking point to all of these other data sets that are out there. So, but you know, I mean, for myself and a lot of astronomers, you usually go to um, 
the existing archives. Like for me, I swear, you don't even have to go to a telescope anymore as an astronomer if you really didn't want to, but it's always nice to do that, of course. <laughs> but there's so much data available in the Hubble archive. You could build a career just using Hubble archive data. Um, so yeah, things like PubMed, I don't know if there's anything quite equivalent in astronomy, not really. You, each journal does their own thing at the moment. There is one good thing, it's, it's called the archive, A-R-X-I-V. And it's the it's a preprint server. So even if my paper is published in a journal that people have to pay to see, we all post it on this free site called the archive, and anybody can look at the papers there for free. Um, so that's been uh, very nice too. So you can find I, that's the thing I read first thing every morning. I look at all the new papers that have been posted on the archive, and then describe because I don't have time to read them all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, maybe yeah. one day we'll have a coast to coast library system that, um, that is, great. Is, is worthy of uh, looking at for all of us. Uh, definitely, it would be nice to have it in California and um, Arizona. Maybe we could all get together and have everything on one big library system. Agree. That would be great. You know, I mean, with ebooks and stuff, it gets a little bit easier these days. I lived in Chile for seven years. I remember when I was there. Uh, at the dormitory where I worked, the librarian actually was able to request a book for me from the U.S. and it was shipped down to Chile and I, you know, read it and sent it back. It was like, it was pretty amazing to me that you could do that. I didn't think that was possible. I know if you Google IPAC, Infrared oh, Processing yeah. Analysis Center at uh, Caltech, uh, you can get the, the ongoing ZTF and all those, uh, the original Sky Survey plates, of course, but all the recent work is available there. And I think they make periodic dumps to the database. But mm -hmm. if you go to the IPAC, it has a nice little search engine. You can look for an object by name or declination to right ascension. And they will show you all of the images they have on catalog. And you can download it in a FITS format or probably some other format like JPEG or that reminds me too, Ken, there's, um, there's a NASA extragalactic database as well, and it doesn't really provide images so much, but you can get data on any galaxy. And I use it all the time in my research, most astronomers do. Um, it, you know, you type in M87 and you'll get everything that's known about M87, every paper that's ever been published oh, on me. M87. It's a, that's the NASA, NED, the NASA Extragalactic Database. It's a really, really rich source of information. But again, it doesn't have so much images, but it has, lots of quantitative data are there any more i should questions? mention okay if people sorry. have more questions i'm just going to say um i put my email address up at the end don't hesitate to email me if you'd like to have any questions about anything um i'm happy to answer questions let's see there we go yeah well thank you very much for for spending time with us and giving us this great talk it